I am not a worshipper. I have never prayed to Shiva or to anybody in my life, never, not even once. But uh, he's been my breath and being always. So here we are exploring and expounding the glorious ways of Shiva. The only way you can grasp what's happening here in the next seven days is uh, the first part of Shiva's teaching was to Parvati. His wife, it was taught in a certain intimacy, in a certain closeness, certain lack of resistance from the other person. If you want to grasp this, you have to sit here like the Devi herself, otherwise that part of Shiva's ways will be totally out of reach. Shiva expounded various types of yogas, every kind. The most gentle and compassionate yoga, the most ruthless forms of yoga, both were expounded. Because with him, he has no qualms about anything. He has no morality, he has no right and wrong for him. His body is just an instrument. Everything in the existence is just an instrument to ultimate realization. So depending upon the level of preparedness of the person who is sitting in front of him, accordingly he went. Shiva, the Adi Yogi, came to you an inner state of stillness where if he closes his eyes, he can sit like this till the end of the world. Simply he sat. Himalai, many of you just went there and came. The mountain is personified, the king of Himalayas had a daughter whose name was Parvati. So Himalai and Parvati came and started serving Shiva where he was sitting and meditating. After many millennia, he opened his eyes and blessed Himalai and then he saw Parvati. Then he told Himalai, it is improper for you to bring a woman where there is an ascetic, you take her away. Immediately, Parvati said, Why are you rejecting me? And who are you to reject me? You are the basic principle of the existence. These two are known as Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is the masculine, Prakriti is the feminine. Prakriti also means nature. Purusha is the fundamental principle, Prakriti is creation. You are purusha, but without prakriti, there is no action in you. You are just inert. 
you cannot do anything by yourself unless there is prakriti. Shiva said, I can dismiss and dissolve prakriti right now. I created it, if I want I will dissolve it this moment. Don't talk to me all this nonsense, you go. Then Parvati said, if you have so much power that you can dissolve prakriti, why are you doing this asceticism? And why are you sitting in these mountains? These mountains are prakriti, the air that you breathe is prakriti, the sky is prakriti, everything is prakriti. And if you dissolve this, you will have no role to play, you will just become inert, absolute emptiness which you are. He liked the argument and the spunk in her, but uh, he still pretended to be very angry and asked her to leave. She refused to leave. She has been performing immense austerities to become the wife of Shiva. She was completely determined and focused, her only focus was this single point agenda she was going on. Then people interfered and Shiva decided to marry her. He married but there was no involvement. He still lived as an ascetic. She was beside him, he accepted her but he still continued as an ascetic. How will she find fulfillment as a woman? So she was desperate to have a child. So when Shiva was not there, when she was having bath on the banks of Kanti Sarovar, where some of you happened to go this time, she took out the sandal paste that she had smeared on her body plus a little earth and formed a little boy out of it and infused life because she wanted to enjoy the child because she's been cursed to be barren. And Ganapati was born. Shiva was in the mountains meditating. After about twelve years' time, he came back. By then, Ganapati has grown into a twelve-year-old boy. Parvati was having bath, so she had asked Ganapati to watch out so that nobody comes this way. He was standing guard for his mother. Shiva came. He was in a certain mood, he was just walking in. After twelve years, he is walking into the house. Ganapati stopped him, said, you cannot enter. He asked, who are you? He said, it doesn't matter who I am, you cannot enter. Shiva just took his axe out and chopped his head off. So the boy fell dead. And Parvati came from a bath and saw her son dismembered. She just went into such sorrow and angry with Shiva, she said, you have to do something. Then he just came home and he killed his own son and now his wife is angry, you know. A lot of trouble. Then he sent out his ganas, go out into the mountains. The first animal that you see, behead the animal, bring the head. I will resurrect this boy once again. So the first animal they saw, was a baby elephant. So they chopped the head of the elephant, brought it, Shiva brought him back to life with an elephant head. So you see Ganapati with an elephant head. And when he saw Parvati's plight, desperately trying to fulfill herself through normal processes of life, 
Shiva out of his compassion said, this is not the way for fulfillment. And then the yoga started. He started teaching the methods of self-realization to Parvati, saying that having children, bearing children is not going to really to lead you to fulfillment. Here is the way and he opened up the possibility of yoga. When we say ways of yoga, we are looking at getting mastery over the fundamental processes of life, the very process of creation and dissolution. In great detail and in such gentle ways, Shiva went about expounding the ways of yoga to Devi. The sutras, the yoga sutras of Shiva are such that almost in every sutra he refers to her as the resplendent one, the gracious one, the beautiful one. So you need to understand that this teaching transpired between two people with utmost intimacy. Intimacy should not be understood as sexuality. Intimacy means there is no resistance. There is no need to fight through this person. This person is absolutely open to whatever is being offered. So it's in such a state that these sutras were offered. So the sutras will be so subtle, so gentle, a thinking mind, an arguing mind will wonder, will such a thing work? But it worked miraculously for her and she became fully realized. Here, if we have to expound yoga in Shiva's ways, you have to really sit in my lap, absolutely no resistance. Either you have to sit here like a Devi or you have to sit here as a child. If you can't do this too, you just have to enjoy the party. We'll make sure the party is good. <laughs> Shiva repeatedly referred to Devi as the resplendent one. So, you must be that way. You must dress that way, you must be that way so that I can refer to you that way, okay? <laughs>
these are purely methods. They're just methods to get a person moving from one state of consciousness to another. There is no teaching involved, there is no philosophy involved. Shiva is not a philosopher, he's a yogi. When I say he is not a philosopher, <clears throat> see it's very easy to be philosophical. In fact, the less you know, the more the chances that you will become philosophical. It's very easy to become a philosopher. You just have to read a couple of books and misunderstand them. You can become a philosopher. <laughs> the reason why you're talking about something that is written in a book is because you have not perceived, grasped life in any depth. If you had uh, even read a single page, of this vast existence. All your life you would be talking only that. There wouldn't be time to talk about anything else. <clears throat> so Shiva is a yogi, purely existential, not philosophical, not intellectual. This is not something that you can understand. This is not something that you have to be convinced about. This is not something that you have to agree with. This is something that you learn to relate with. If you can relate to it and experiment with it, it will do miraculous things for you. You could become as blissful as Devi became, that she just went mad as a march here and romped about the mountains for many millennia We'll curtail the time for you, but we got the mountains, we got the madness, we got everything. <laughs> As he started expounding the various dimensions of yoga, Devi took on various forms. She became love, she became compassion, she became anger, she became fury, she became deadly, she became very pleasant, she became unpleasant, she took on every kind of form that could happen within the human consciousness. As she took on these forms, they went from the subtle to the more and more intense kind of forms. As Devi took on various forms, the seasons changed, the atmosphere in the world changed because she is the Shakti, the basic energy behind the existence. As she went into many phases of her consciousness, everything around changed. And then he brought her to a state to make her realize all this is just a play of energy. She is none of these things. What she is, is beyond all these forms that she can take. And to harness that energy and make it happen the way it should happen is the science of yoga. And the exposition of yoga started. Shiva said, what you went through right now is just a play of your energy, this is not you. Then Devi asked, 
how do I realize that this is not me? Then Shiva gave her a simple process. The dancer who is here, her name is Anita Ratnam, probably most of you already know. She is one of the foremost exponents of uh, fusion kind of Bharatanatyam. She is internationally acclaimed artist. Uh, she has performed almost every part of the world. So uh, she will be doing the Nada Radhana. This is a part of the Indian temple culture that is the puja or the worship was not just verbal. So people learn to use their whole body as a form of worship. Many of you, you're practicing Surya Namaskar, which is a form of worship, using the entire body to get into your worshipful activity within you. Similarly, dance also was used as a form of worship and as a form of involvement. You said, until you explode, I'm not your guru, I'm just your friend. N now I'm troubled, I want a guru. I've got a few friends already, but I, <laughs> I want a guru. <laughs> so here I am to explode. <laughs> Please explode me. So, uh, I want you to understand, you're sufficiently packed with explosives, every one of you. Only thing is, some of you have kept it so damp it doesn't light up or some of you don't know where the fuse is. <laughs> so, I can easily light it up. If you're damp, we can dry you, the weather's cloudy, it is not assisting, but I can dry you up and light you up. You just have to allow it. So right now, you don't know how to allow. If I say, allow me to do it, am not I allowing you? I came for the program, I'm sitting here, what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> so you don't know what it means to allow. So right now, I'm telling you, just be involved, absolutely. Involvement does not mean 
சிவா தட்ஸ் நாட் இன் மாக்மெண்ட் யூ ஜஸ்ட் கோ சிம்பிளி கோ டோட்டல் இன்வால்வ்மெண்ட் லைக் this is the last thing that you're going to do in your life like that you must do everything every breath every step every word every act you must do it like this is the last thing you're going to do in your life with that involvement if you do i'll explode you because you have you're packed with explosives every one of you <laughs> i don't have to you know put any explosives into you you are sufficiently packed but uh, damp or hiding the fuse <laughs> you don't know where the fuse is you don't know how to light you don't have a match stick i have all the fire you want if you just show some involvement we will explode you as the story goes brahma as he often does granted the boon of invincibility to mahisha a powerful ambitious asura except brahma said i can't give you immortality so mahisha thinks and says make me invincible to any god and any man except a woman and so when mahisha begins his reign of terror shiva and vishnu congregate they not just chastise brahma but they also say to themselves our wives are really too gentle to take on this brute so we have to create a new divinity a mighty force whose energy will be as swift as an arrow unafraid who will rush forth to shatter any obstacle she will be the best of us shiva says and so is created Durga Tonight's presentation is called Andari one of the many names that Durga has given another being Ishvari the wife of Isha Shiva The first scene in Andari describes the goddess as world mother and as in one of the old epics she is described as a giant female spider who spins the world as her web from her body the world is created and she watches with great joy at her creation but then slowly the dark forces prevail aggressive powerful form as durga jay 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 na pali dal pali dal mati devi parvat devi varamig devi durga yane for 10 days and 10 nights mahisha is ensnared and victory the goddess is led 
in a great procession to the ocean where she's immersed and everybody waits for her return into their homes the next year. of Andari, Durga is so disgusted with the greed of humanity that like a female spider who not only swim, spins a web but can consume it and destroy what she has created, she decides it's, it's time to completely annihilate everything in order for the world to be created again. All that is remaining is a lamp which symbolizes hope. A pregnant woman in whose womb is an unborn female child that she carries and hangs around one year like her yearning to show her compassion. Now that uh, Anita was, uh, gave us a fantastic display of Durga, uh, <clears throat> I think we should say something about Linga Bhairavi. A fiercer aspect of the Devi in the form of Linga Bhairavi will be consecrated here as a part of the Dhyanalinga temple. It will involve uh, various aspects, it will be a completely different kind of consecration and a different kind of space and energy. So, this temple will be coming at the southernmost corner of… southern… southwestern corner of uh, the main temple, the Parikrama that's coming up. Maybe many of you will have the opportunity to witness the consecration. Sadhguru, I was just wondering that in the stories that you tell us about Kartike and the elephant god or what is depicted in the dance, um, what is the spiritual uh, message or should we just hear it as a story or there's something deeper? When Parvati, I'm telling you another story. When Parvati asked uh, Shiva <clears throat> of uh, the spiritual significance of many of his actions, I can understand this, you're meditating, I can understand, okay, that is a spiritual thing. But now you're dancing, now you're hunting, now you're drinking, now you're smoking. What is the spiritual significance of all this? And you have all kinds of distorted and demented beings around you. What is the spiritual significance of all these people? I don't see any spirituality in them. Why do you have them around you? So Shiva said, <clears throat> there is nothing in the existence which is not spiritual. Everything is spiritual, unrealized. Now, all the methods that we're talking about, whether it is a story or a joke or a meditation or a process that we're doing, it is just to bring it into your awareness. What is it that you're clinging to? 
what is it that you have to… what is it that's obstructing you? You just have to look at those things. Don't try to understand where to go, you don't know where to go. What is it that is stopping you? You just have to understand the obstacles. Don't try to understand the root of life because it's not a dimension to be understood but you can become that. One important aspect of your life which doesn't allow you to live your life in total intensity, which doesn't allow this energy to burst forth with great exuberance is self-preservation. Self-preservation means constantly battling against death, yes? The instinct of self-preservation means constantly battling against death. Or in other words, it is the presence of death constantly there, every moment of your life, whether you're conscious of it or not conscious of it, every moment the presence of death is there, which makes you restrained about everything. If death was not there, as it's been removed for you for these seven days, <laughs> if death was not there, you would do so many things, isn't it? You wouldn't hesitate for anything. You would jump off the mountain if you felt like it. So, tomorrow, the whole day we will spend on death. I want you intensely involved with this. I am talking about it today so that you are prepared for it, you don't resist it. I have already given you the guarantee, seven days you are guaranteed. So tomorrow you must make a huge effort to die. Keeping you alive is my business, okay? The greatest uh, calamity of the human mind is that uh, it is against death because the moment you reject death, you also reject life. Either we can refer to, refer to this process that you're right now going through as life or we can refer to this process as death. It is happening, one day it is going to be complete. But the very word death has brought so much fear into people simply because of a complete misunderstanding about the very nature of what it is. 
the way most people have treated their body, suppose somebody offers you a deal, you drop this old body, we'll give you a new body, won't you make the deal? You'll make the deal, isn't it? So, you're not afraid of losing the body, that's not the issue. It is the personality, it is your ego which is so afraid of losing itself. Where is your ego located? It's in every part of your body. I'm talking the physical geography of the ego. It's everywhere, but its main location is in the face. So right now, we want to deface you a little bit. For today, you should not be able to look at your face, nor should anybody be able to look at your face. For that we have a device. you should become faceless. Once your ego is not a problem, then you will see death is not a problem. It's very simple. Death is a cosmic joke. If you… if you get the joke, when you fall on the other side, It'll be wonderful. If you don't get the joke, if you're here, you fear the other side. When the other side comes, you just don't know what it's about. So today it's an attempt to bring you to an experience where you grasp the cosmic joke, where death becomes a laughing matter in your life. Here we will go through a certain process where uh, you have the opportunity to go through the process of death, of course with the guarantee that I have already given you. So do not miss this opportunity because now I am giving you the guarantee, you can die and you'll be back in a few minutes. So do not resist it, do not miss the opportunity once you know the relaxation of death, then life becomes an utterly effortless process. Death is the creation of the ignorant, death is the creation of the unaware. If you are aware, it's life, life and life alone. Shiva is a god who should not be named because to name him is to limit and curtail him. At the same time, the son of his many, many names also bring out the indescribable mystery of who he is or indescribable mysteries of what this creation is. Of his various forms, Kala or Mahakala is an important at the same time a fierce form. As Mahakala, he is the lord of time. As Kala Bhairava, he is the destroyer of time. When we talk about transcendence, when we talk about spirituality, yoga, we are seeing how to go beyond the limitations of time and space. 
because time and space belongs to the physical plane of the existence. Once you aspire to be spiritual, what it means is you're aspiring to be something more than the physical. Once you're something more than the physical, that means you're aspiring to be beyond the limitations of time and space. It is only the foolish, it is only the ignorant who will try to stop the process of death. The aware, the enlightened are seeing how to make death into a tremendous opportunity to move from one dimension to another. Anyway, nature is releasing you from the physical. If you do it with the right sense of awareness, that could become your ultimate liberation too. Here today, Santosh will present a certain dance piece on Mahakala.